When was the last antibiotic that was invented? Well, antibiotics are discovered all the time. Um, antibiotics are also created. We can make them through synthetic organic chemistry where we basically do experiments in a laboratory. Uh, or we can go hunting for them. And the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, approves new drugs, new antibiotics all the time. Um, and we have this pipeline of drugs that are going to be approved this year and in the years ahead. Um, and what we see is that there are lots of drugs that are in development. Um, how many will be approved this year is impossible to say. Um, and the other part that people don't realize is that when an antibiotic is approved, it's not a blanket approval of you can use drug X for anything. It's for very specific indications. So you can use that drug for urinary tract infections or pneumonia or bloodstream infections. And often that approval can send stock prices plummeting if it's approved for something that the company wasn't banking on. And this is a classic example for a company called Acaeogen. They developed a new antibiotic for superbugs called Plazomycin. And they bet heavily that it would be approved for bloodstream infections. But instead it was approved for urinary tract infections. And we didn't really need another new drug for urinary tract infections. And nine months after the drug was approved, the company filed for bankruptcy. And a lot of companies are now looking at Acaeogen and saying, we don't want to end up like them. And that's causing a lot of skittishness among the research and development teams at a number of pharmaceutical companies. In chapter two of Superbugs, what did you mean by a golden era? Well, the golden era of antibiotics was uh, the 1950s when we were pumping out new drugs seemingly every few months and life expectancy blossomed. Humans were living longer because infections weren't killing them. And that golden era also predated our appreciation of the dangers of antibiotics. So nobody really knew that something like chloramphenicol could cause gray baby syndrome or that antibiotics could destroy your kidneys or your brain uh, or that they could lead to superbugs. And so I called it the golden era because it was this time of brimming enthusiasm. Its possibilities seemed limitless and it really did help humanity, but we also didn't appreciate the potential downside of antibiotics. In chapter 23 of Superbugs, what did you mean by breakthrough? One of the big breakthroughs in drug development is figuring out where we can hunt for new antibiotics. And it turns out that one of the best places to look is in the soil beneath our feet. That beneath our feet there are all kinds of life forms, fungi, parasites, bacteria, viruses, that are engaged in a subterranean warfare. And what I mean by that is that they are all secreting chemicals into the environment to kill what's around them. It's a subterranean survival of the fittest. And what we're now figuring out is that if we start hunting into that soil and if we could pluck out one of those chemicals, well, we may have an antibiotic. It's something that was designed naturally and specifically to kill different pathogens in the environment. The challenge is figuring out where to look and how do we develop them? How do we decide which one is worth investing in? Um, if you were to just take a scoop of soil from your local playground, there may be five or six different drugs in that soil, but we can't test all of them. They're all a billion dollars worth of testing. Uh, so what we're trying to figure out is where do we put our efforts, where do we put our resources, and how do we match up what we can find with the needs of the patients? Can you sum up everything we've talked about in 15 seconds. The biggest misconception about superbugs is that we are running out of treatments. And the truth is that we are coming up with new treatments all the time. But the challenge is going to be identifying what's the next deadly pathogen. Right now there's a lot of talk about a virus, a novel coronavirus that has just emerged from the Wuhan pr province in China and uh, what we can do about it. And we're seeing all kinds of uh, aggressive measures, quarantining millions of people, um, coming up with new diagnostic tests. People ask me all the time whether or not we need to come up with a vaccine for it or new treatments for it. And this is what makes the study of superbugs so exciting, that it's always something new. Um, but we need to also be realistic about what pathogens we have in the environment. The fact that influenza 
will likely kill far more people than this coronavirus that's getting a lot of attention. And whether or not vaccines could be saving more lives than all of the resources combined that we put towards uh, quarantining people for the Wuhan virus. So uh, the thing about superbugs is that it's not going away. It's fascinating. And you've got a lot of people who wake up every day trying to figure out how do you protect the most vulnerable patients. What's the one thing I need to do today? The most important thing that you can do to protect yourself are things that people don't usually like doing. Things like getting a good night's sleep, not drinking too much, trying to eat a balanced diet. Uh, the people I see who run into trouble either have a defect in their immune system or they're running themselves ragged. They're worn down and they're becoming vulnerable to the things that are in our environment. So it's not a, a, an exciting answer to say try to get a good night's sleep and not drink too much and eat a balanced diet. But those are the first steps that you can take towards just putting yourself in a position to succeed. Why was it important for you to come here and speak at the real truth about health conference? You know, one of the things I really enjoy is reaching new audiences. And a lot of the lectures that I give are actually to academics, to doctors who are general practitioners, who may know a little bit about superbugs, but not a lot. And I like educating doctors, but I've also found that I really like educating patients. I spend a lot of time at the bedside um, with my white coat on talking to patients about where their drug-resistant bacterium came from. And I have found increasingly that while I enjoy talking to patients, I also enjoy talking to the average person on the street who just wants to know more, who may be um, nervous about this, and I can provide some reassurance, uh, or the person who may not realize that they're at risk. And so I come from a family of educators, and the thing that I really enjoy doing is educating the public about a topic that I care so deeply about. If people want to learn more about your work, uh, how can they do that? Well, the easiest thing is to go to my website, which is www.drmattmccarthy.com. I'm also on Twitter, Dr. Matt McCarthy. Um, and then if you Google me, you can find lots of uh, pieces that I've written, not just for academic presses, but um, my books, uh, my journalism. I've written for the uh, Slate, Sports Illustrated, the New York Times. I'm a nonfiction book reviewer for USA Today. Uh, I write all kinds of stuff, uh, and I would be um, uh, eager to share any and all of that with people who are at this conference.